Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Don Easterbrook. He is a geologist who for the last 50 years has been looking at ancient and modern climate change and abrupt climate changes, looking at glaciers and the ice core analysis. He is the author of several books. He has looked at the causes of climate change, the correlation of glacial fluctuations, the Pacific decadal oscillation, climate and solar variation. He's looked at a 500 year record of temperature changes using oxygen isotope data from the Greenland ice core, the effect of CO2 on climate change and geologic history of climate change. He has a lot to offer and a very unique perspective that we need to really listen to. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome, Don Easterbrook, to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Good morning. I don't think that we would be able to easily get through your books, Surface Processes and Landforms and the Interpretation of Landforms from Topographic Maps and Air Photographs, a laboratory manual. It sounds like it's very technical for people who maybe need a frame of reference that's deeper than mine. What do you think? Uh, I think that's that's correct. These were these are technical books that were written primarily for geology students at the university level, and it presupposes that you have backgrounds in physics, math, chemistry, and basic geology. So these are not things that are written for the layman. These are are written for uh, students of uh, science in in one um, one discipline or another. You say that the past is the key to the future regarding climate change. Talk to us about why that is and why a geologist has a totally different perspective when looking at climate change. Well, I have always said that in order to know where we're headed in the future, we need to know where we've been in the past. And that's something that most geologists are pretty good at because we have a broader time frame in which we, over which we look at things. And one of the advantages that that kind of a perspective has is that it allows one to look for patterns that have occurred over decades or centuries or millennia or hundreds of thousands of, of years. And that gives a good look at where we really are in the long-term spectrum of the, the total changes that have occurred uh, with climate uh, over long periods of time. And it's a lot different because it also is based on real-time, real-world physical evidence rather than on computer modeling. Uh, which, as you know, is garbage in, garbage out. And so uh, most geologists um, base their conclusions on real evidence that you can measure, that you can see, uh, that you can work with, and real data rather than um, some kind of of computer-based scenario in which you have to make a lot of assumptions. So uh, we would like to think that we're closer to the way the the real world um, works rather than uh, the way some computer thinks it ought to work. Now, in the context of understanding climate change, because there's so much politics, as a geologist, when you're looking at data, real world data, how do you know the data hasn't been hampered? How do you know you're getting clean data from real world testing sites or measuring sites? Well, A, it has to be reproducible. That is, you have to have uh, assurance that what you're seeing is, in fact, true. Uh, There are various problems sometimes uh, with respect to the way people view the data, but the data shouldn't change. And one of the problems that is now being experienced by those people who are working with climate change is that with respect to short-term climate changes, mostly global temperatures, that the data has been so badly manipulated, this came out came out in the climate gate scandals in, in England, um, that it's hard to to know really what you can trust and what you can't trust. And there have been some studies made of how valid the surface data is, and what has been determined by experts in in the field, by meteorologists, is that something like eighty percent of the weather reporting stations in the United States are are not um, valid in the sense that uh, they do not conform to the rigid specifications for a site recording. So can we trust the surface data? And the answer is probably not. So the only uh, chance we have then to do better than that is to look at the satellite data, 
And that data is um, reproducible. It, it is? is uh, it, it is. It's done by um, satellites. It's done by machines, so there's no personal bias built in. And it gives us a, a rather different picture than the picture you get from the surface data. So to answer your question, uh, you have to evaluate how good the data is in some way. And one of the best ways to do is to test it. For example, if a computer model says it's going to be colder by one or two degrees in the next 10 years, and that prediction was made 10 years ago, we can check it and see if it, if it, if it, if it holds true. Now, during that time, the data, the real-life data, not the computer data, uh, shouldn't change. I mean, data is data. Once it's, once it's done, it's done. What about NOAA and NASA and relying on their translation of what's occurring relative to data? What do they do? Both, both NOAA and uh, NASA manipulate the, the data. Uh, for example, uh, we, about a decade ago or so, 1934 was considered to be the warmest year of, of, this, of the past century. And then over a period of years, they manipulated the data so that instead of 1934 being uh, about a full degree Fahrenheit warmer than 1998, which was the, the next uh, in line, uh, the, uh, the NASA folks adjusted the data for 1934 downward and adjusted the 1998 data upward in, in trying to make 1998 warmer than 1934. And this the data manipulation consists of throwing out stations uh, primarily those which have a cooling record. And in looking at the data globally, something like 60 to 80 percent of the weather stations that used to be reporting uh, are excluded for one reason or another. Sometimes they're not even, these stations don't exist anymore. Uh, but then they average over large areas data that's accumulated from around the margins. For example, there, there are almost no recording stations in the Arctic. So they take some data around the fringes, it'd be like taking a temperature reading in New York and a temperature reading in, in San Francisco, and then trying to extrapolate from that what the climate is like over the entire United States. And then they cast this into computer, uh, various computer type models, and come up with, uh, with some numbers. So, the, the, the problem is that in almost all cases, both NOAA and NASA always adjust their data to make it warmer than the raw data. How do we know that for sure? Um, John, how do we know that for do, sure? Uh, adjust things so that the data would come out being, being cooler. And this has been done all over the world. It's, it's been done in New Zealand, Australia, in the U.S., and they call it homogenization of data. If you homogenize the data, you can come up with a, a uh, what had been previously a cooling trend in a temperature curve and make it into a warming trend. Uh, one of the, the, the most heinous of these was in um, Australia and New Zealand where there was a, a, a cooling trend over a period of a couple of decades, and they adjusted the data and made it into about a two-degree warming curve. How do we know that? How do we know they adjusted it and changed it? That's, to me, the key question. How do we know that that's a fact? Oh, because they have published uh, the early data, and then we, we can see how it's changed. Uh, NASA, for example, uh, published uh, data sets going back to 1987, and then there have been various upgrades. And if you look at the original data in 1987 and look at the, in, their interpretation of that data today, it's quite different than what it was when it was recorded in 1987. So it makes you wonder about how objective uh, this data manipulation is. And... The, the people who are making these adjustments are noted for uh, being adherents of, of um, CO2 caused global warming. So they, the people who are doing the manipulation uh, have a, a pretty widely recognized bias. Well, let's talk about now that you're mentioning CO2. In some of your writing, you talk about climate changes in the geologic record show a regular pattern of alternate warming and cooling within a 25 to 30 year period for the past 500 years. But you also say that numerous abrupt short-lived warming and cooling episodes, much more intense than recent warming and cooling, occurred during the last ice age, none of which have been caused by changes in atmospheric CO2. Why? Well, the, the, the data is, is very, very unequivocal, and it comes from world standard uh, ice core data, uh, and especially isotope data. 